that I would give a lecture here to close out The Grapes of Wrath. Um, and that's the title. There you have it. The Grapes of Wrath, Five Reasons Why It Is Not a Timeless Classic. Now, I got this mail shortly after I sent that mail, all employees, from John here. All right. John says, quote, it's one of my favorite books of all time, and now you're going to tell me that it sucks. Well, I just won't stand for that. So I encourage John to come along today. I said, well, come along and see what it is that I have to say specifically about the book in question. I remind you of the title. That's the title, Five Reasons Why It Is Not a Timeless Classic. So let's get this straight. The problem is not classic. I think that The Grapes of Wrath is a stonewall classic, which means it is unequivocally a magnificent book, one of the greatest books in the history of the English language. That is not the issue. The problem, or the problem I have at any rate, the problem is with the word timeless as a seal well knows from her assignments. Right. Timeless is problematic for two reasons. Pro problematic to me for two reasons. One is philosophical, and the other is ideological. Now, philosophically, a text is referred to as timeless in the present. But there is no pure present. There is no pure present or moment of now that is not already subjected to the diachrony of the past. Now, it's gone. Now. So we associate the idea of the present with the notion of presence, at least the notion of our presence. By way of example, let us say that we have decided to, we, we exist in a Roadrunner cartoon, we have decided to, to, to blow up Roadrunner, we are two versions of Coyote, and um, you are there with a plume for the explosive, and I'm watching around the bend of the road to see if Coyote's coming, and he turns the corner, and I say now. It's already too late. If you try to anticipate before I say now, it's already too early. So there is a problem with the notion of now. It is either immersed in time, so it is not the moment of now, or it is transcendent or above time. It can't be both. Now, ideologically, the problem with timeless is that it has a tendency to mean above or beyond the context of socio-material conditions. It is timelessness as another form of transcendence. Interestingly, though, the word timeless to describe literature first appears in the 19th century. One would imagine if literature was timeless, then it was timeless for all time. We were talking for all time about the timelessness of literature, but we weren't. We've only been doing it for about 150 years. Why is that? Matthew Arnold wrote famously, quote, in the timelessness of Shakespeare's work is the perpetual confirmation of English values, of English custom, of English tradition. And there's the source for it there, Matthew Arnold, you see, in correct MLA format. Yes. Yeah. Victorian society brought with it key questions about God in terms of advances and discoveries in geology, in astronomy, in biology, in psychology. Geologically, we find in the 19th century that the world is millions of years old. Astronomy reveals to us that rather than the universe being small and God maybe sitting above a cloud peeping his head around the corner, that the universe is vast, that the stars are hundreds of thousands of miles away. It makes the earth seem small. Biology, evolution, that we evolved as we crawled out of the ocean. And psychology, with Freud, the idea that we don't necessarily know why we do what we do, that in actual fact we may have other reasons that we weren't aware of. All of these shake, to a degree, our sense of the conviction of who we were, where we were in the 19th century. In response to this loss of certainty, Terry Eagleton argues that timeless values and truths embodied in literature become a type of substitute for religion. This is specifically in England in the 19th century. Further, universal values encourage solidarity across classes and a shared identification in a national body, which is always useful for indoctrination into imperial ideology. Remember as well, the 19th century is, is the vanguard of imperialism. It is the moment when the West is moving into the East and, and planting a flag and saying, hello, this belongs to us now. And you see this, you see what Eagleton is talking about there, probably its most common and regular manifestation is in relation to sport, where all of the differences in a society are, are put aside during the course of a World Cup and everyone from a nation is united behind the idea of the country and are one, unified. In other words, according to Eagleton, timeless literature discourages class consciousness or a focus on inequitable material conditions and their inevitable sources in various social injustices. In other words, we don't think about things in their context. Now, a second reason for advocating the timelessness of literature is that it implies literature somehow resists or avoids the pitfalls presented by the present. 
In other words, it is timeless precisely because it is not present. Hello there, Adam. Eagleton also notes in this regard, the notion of a transcendent literature, literary temporality also positions literature in opposition to the dehumanizing effects of modern mass culture. The study of English becomes a moral crusade and a struggle for people's souls. Such a view is deeply nostalgic and suspicious of, even hostile towards, popular culture such as film, pop jazz, and advertising. In other words, the idea that when we say something is timeless, we mean it's timeless kind of of the past, and therefore it is better than what is happening in the present. Now, if The Grapes of Wrath is a timeless work in this type of context, this suggests that the material and historical conditions that contextualize the story are irrelevant. The text is effectively depoliticized. It also suggests that the novel arrived to us in the present as a romantic ideal, simultaneously pointing to a lost past, a past that was better than the present. So the question is, how does one rematerialize the grapes of wrath, re-territorialize it, if you like? How does one bring back to it a sense of its importance and its place in time? Answer, and note after answer, there is a question mark. I offer this not as an equivocal, an unequivocal answer, but as a potential answer among answers. To argue that the grapes of wrath offers a vision, our version of time that is not only timely, and timely in the sense of, of now, But because it is timely, of a now that is always changing, it is also simply and profoundly timeful. So I'm saying it's not timeless, it's timeful, it's full of time. Here's an iconic shot from the movie version of The Grapes of Wrath. Right? Henry Fonda looking rugged and handsome, Tom Jode, Maha Jode, Rose of Sharon staring at something, intensely staring at something, a still from the movie. What might it be? I propose to you. It's a poster for the movie in which they are. They're both monochromic shots, monochrom monochromatic, black and white shots. Could be the same time. Could be the Jode car there behind the poster. Got the bus? But of course not. And yet I'm standing here now showing you a slide from the movie, which is based on the book, and a, a photograph of a poster for the movie, and it's all happening at the same time. And yet the now is never now. This is a quote from Walter Benjamin that Reem is going to read for us. A clay painting named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past. Where we, perce where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise. It has got caught in, the, in his wings with such a violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm, is uh, the storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. The storm is what we call progress. It's, uh, don't bother checking out because it's such a disappointment when I actually checked out the Klee painting on which the statement is based. The statement is much more evocative than the painting. But the idea of an angel of history, a figure being blown, that is carrying with it the wreckage of all history, this momentum, this propulsion, arriving into the present and dragging us along with it. This is what we call progress, a moment in which there is all time that is not now, that is not frozen, is not part of a timeless, but is essentially a type of now in which all time is. Now, the ancient Greeks had such an embodied notion of history. Aristotle in the Poetics suggests that there are three levels on which tragedy has an impact. The individual, the social, the political. Think of Oedipus, those of you who studied Oedipus Rex, that the individual truth 
of what happens to Oedipus and the suffering that he bears. The social ramifications of that in relation to the effect on his family and the political ramifications given that he is the king of Thebes.